Hello friends, welcome to another brand new episode of Bala and Bala Perspectives on Education. So both the Balas are here with me today. Mr. G. Bala Subramanian, he's better known as Bala G to many of you, uh, many of the educators uh, from our country. He's known, of course, more for the role that he had taken uh, formerly, that is the Director of Academics of CBSE. Sir, welcome for this, uh, to this you. discussion. And to my right, I have Mr. Giri Bala Subramanian, better known as Pick Brain, the Quiz Master. Most of you who have quizzed with him would know him very well. Thank you so much for joining us today, Pick Brain. All right. So today's topic of discussion is continuous learning and certification for teachers. Now, certification for teachers has been going on for a long, long time. Um, in between, I sort of thought that teachers got into a frenzy of acquiring as many certifications as possible. So today, we are going to explore and talk about this particular topic. My first question to the two of you, why do teachers need continuous learning as an essential professional requirement? So. Well, I think uh, the very fact uh, that teacher is dealing with their learner, the teacher becomes a learner himself or herself. Uh, if the teacher is not a learner, he cannot be or she cannot be educating another learner. Because only a lamp which burns can light another lamp. And therefore, you really find that the teachers have to be learning themselves. Uh, to, I have always said that a postgraduate degree or a teaching degree is only a passport to the profession and not a visa. And visa is what is given by the learner. And the learner wants current knowledge. And today we are in a world where there is a knowledge flux going on. When I was a, a learner, uh, probably 80% of information I got was from the formal system. And 20% of the information I got was from the informal system outside the school. Today the process is reversed. 80% of the information is flowing from the external world and 20% of the information is flowing from the internal world. So a teacher needs to be conscious of what is happening. The scientific technological uh, you know, uh, changes, the information gateways that have opened have necessitated the teacher to synergize the formal learning with the informal learning. Rather, the informal learning with the formal learning, the reverse is all, osmosis is also true. So continuous learning uh, doesn't really mean that the teacher is uh, going for a particular course of study and gets a certificate. Now, continuous learning is a process of opening up of the minds of uh, the teachers to each and everything that happens all around and relate their own disciplinary concepts to what's happening around and thereby, uh, you know, enlarging the scope of the skill and the application of knowledge to the learners. That can happen only when the teacher is a continuous learner. If they close their mind's eyes, probably they will become blind to the world of knowledge in the days to come. All right. Your view? Uh, I think when you look at learning from a teacher perspective, there are two parts to teaching. What I teach and how I teach it. The second part is completely changing today. Today, if you take leading academic institutions like Harvard and MIT, they put up their course material free for anybody in the world to use. That is the what I teach. And they're so confident in saying, the difference that I make is in the way I teach it. So the how I teach is what is unique to me, which I don't put up on the portal. What I put up is the material that you will learn. So I think both these therefore require continuous learning. And what's the shadow of continuous learning? That to me is the more important part. It's continuous unlearning. That is what helps you evolve. When you are willingly unlearning, you evolve. 
Forget about teaching. Take products in this world. They are continuously killing themselves. That is the process of unlearning. You've got iPhone 1. By the time you are happy with iPhone 1, they have told you, no, 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 you bought the wrong model, buy 2. By the time you are happy with iPhone 2, you got 3, 4 today, I think you got 10 or 11 or 12. I don't know what number. We get convinced that the previous one was not the right one and we buy the next one. It is nothing but a process of self-evolution. Android has different versions, Intel has different versions, Apple would have different versions. So if those products can impose on themselves the willingness to let go of their own past voluntarily, I think we as teachers and educators should look at that. It's like the next version upgrade. You got to keep upgrading. So we're talking about having an open mind towards continuous learning. Absolutely, yes. All right. And it's a necessity. All right. So let's now move into the next part of the discussion. What are the areas for continuous enrichment for learning for teachers that is essential for teachers? I think uh, the hint has already been given uh, by Mr. Giri in his uh, comment. Uh, the two uh, aspects of learning. One is what you teach and the second how you teach. Uh, to me, both of them are changing. Uh, what you teach, for example, the way I learned electromagnetism when I was a student using a bell or something, an iron box or something, I don't teach it anymore. My concepts are entirely different. So, you know, uh, all that I did my in post-graduation probably is being taught in the eighth class now. Therefore, I have got to be completely aware of the kind of content, you know, the knowledge is both converging and diverging, you know. So what happens is, uh, when I studied chemistry, probably we had three aspects of chemistry, analytical, inorganic, and physical. Now I've got 50 branches of chemistry. No, we, we never thought of biology and mathematics, uh, uh, you know, having a marriage. Today we've got biomathematics, biophysics, we've got biotechnology. So this kind of, uh, you know, synergy and uh, between uh, disciplines are coming. So my teachers need to be sensitive to this integration of uh, knowledge, synthesis of knowledge. So content-wise, upgradation of knowledge appears to be very, very important. This is one end. The other end where they need to talk about is uh, the, the uh, way that uh, you teach, you know. For example, today the tools of technology that are, are very fast. With uh, the, you know, what do you call, artificial intelligence and augmented reality is coming through. My teacher in class uh, uh, one and two can create a zoo in the classroom itself, right? And my teacher of class six, uh, when she wants to teach about a solar system, my teacher used to call for half a dozen boys and ask them to stand around and you move like this, uh, you know, sun and the moon and all that. But today you can create with augmented reality a solar system in the class and the children can say, wow, there is a, the, I mean, a sun here, the moon there. So that's a kind of uh, uh, the, the experience that you have. As a chemistry teacher, I was not able to take my children to a petrochemical factory, I used to draw what some a few, a few things uh, on the uh, you know blackboard or hang a, a map and show that. But today I can take a virtual tour of uh, a petrochemical laboratory while I teach about the fractional distillation uh, to my children. So the way you teach is absolutely changing. Real-time experiences, real-time learning are brought to the classroom level. That's the third, second dimension. The third dimension, how we evaluate a child is also changing because we used to give a, a you know, quarterly examination, half hourly examination. Today we talk about the new national education policy talks about the 3D assessment, where the self-assessment of the learner, the peer assessment of the learner and the teacher's assessment. Now formative uh, you know, assessment as a continuous process of learning. So all aspects of uh, classroom management in terms of content, pedagogy, assessment is changing. Relationship between the teacher and the uh, child is learning with blended learning coming through over there. So you have an offline learning, or on, on, you know, online learning, and newer models of uh, blended learning. There are at least 12 different models of blended learning. So all these things necessitate the teacher to be a continuous learner in one aspect of the profession or the other. All that in one way, a sentence, if I could say, uh, we dem it demands a professional approach to teaching uh, uh, by the teachers. It is not 
personal approach to teaching is a professional approach to teaching. What about you? So I think continuous learning is imperative at a teacher level. <clears throat> also because everybody around today is looking at what do I get from the time that I am spending with this person, including the student. Today, like sir said, there is informal learning and formal learning, which means the teacher is not my only source of information and knowledge, which is what it was in our generation. In today's generation, the child is actually assessing the teacher, saying, is this teacher adding value to me as a student? So I think the focus on learning for teachers constantly is also on the value you are adding. It's coming down to those elements and it's important even for the teacher to feel good. It's extremely important that the teacher realizes I am genuinely adding value. So all these elements like assessments, instant assessments, etc. are facilitators to help you self-evaluate whether you are adding value. So from that perspective, I think it's become very, very critical. So what would be few of the areas you think are important for teachers to uh, See, go through? If you look at specifics, the cognitive area is very, very important. Modern technological adaptation for a teacher is important to assess for himself or herself. Not assume that I am a generationally relevant teacher. Do I know the latest tools like sir mentioned, etc. is a good assessment. No generation can take away the importance of pedagogy. It is critical and core to a teacher. You can't substitute that. So a teacher needs to be valued. I feel a very important area of assessment for a teacher or certifications for a teacher would also revolve around how they manage their so schools may want to look at creating, it's very difficult to take an online test or something like that on, you know, a classroom engagement because with every year's classroom, your ability to engage that classroom changes. Between A section and B section, your ability to engage the class changes. You would have one notorious class, you would have one super obedient class. So you can't say this is the efficiency level of the teacher. But it is very important for the teacher to know in different circumstances how do I fare? The teacher needs to know that. There is no requirement to give a report card for that. But these are areas where I think there is continuous evolution of the teacher in the aspect that we are discussing. All right. But, but you do believe that cognition and there pedagogy areas, could yes. be... There are uh, areas, new technology, cognition. All of those are areas that a teacher can focus on. All right. So my next question to the two of you. Is self-learning and self-assessment becoming a new model in a teacher's professional progression? Absolutely. The reason is, uh, you know, uh, when possibly when I was a teacher, I was looking for an agency who will train me. But today, the flow of information, the flow of uh, uh, knowledge and the kind of uh, uh, skill empowerment is so varied, so fast, no single agency can empower you uh, with that. Uh, you know, institutional training offered by any board of education or any other training agency, by the time they would uh, complete one cycle of uh, uh, learning, uh, training for the teachers, it will take five years or so to come. Unless otherwise you have a parallel processing models. And in such parallel processing models, you don't get uh, trainers who can do, uh, you know, the training at the same time level of quality. So given all that, uh, the, the teacher cannot afford to wait to have the information that you can't postpone it by a month because you are late by that time. It is day in and day out. Okay. So you have a term, uh, I mean, technology available. You have got a, a button available. Just click it. The information comes to you and you can uh, learn at your own pace, at your own uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, curiosity level and self-learning is the one and the only way that you can stay current and competent in your profession. Okay. Now, 
that goes along with that is a self assessed structure because to fact that i have learned something is no guarantee that is the most authentic view so my learning has got to be credible validated and should be uh, realistic and relevant to the situation in which i am handling therefore i need to revalidate re myself on a continuous basis there comes uh, the uh, the the evaluation of a teacher and i think we don't have adequate uh, uh, you know um, uh, evaluating agencies in this country i think we, we must have multiple uh, assessment agencies in the country for validating the quality of teaching by the teachers and that these teachers can go and evaluate themselves through these agencies and get certified not because the certificate is going to matter but the fact that you have gone through a process and somebody tells you you are current i think that is the certificate that you get i therefore both these are unavoidable absolutely i have always believed while people might think oh this person has too many certifications in her or his profile certifications actually do matter because you go through a process of learning while you get that certification it's just it's not just a piece of paper what's what's your view on the self learning and self assessment towards the career progression of a or professional progression of a teacher uh, two parts one is in the context of any p any p recommends 50 hours for a teacher it is going to be impossible for any institution to let go of its teachers for 50 hours a year to go and attend training programs humanly impossible at any given point in time you then require 20% extra teacher force to be able to manage your classroom because 20% will at any given point in time be attending training programs the only solution therefore is self learning the only way teachers will complete those 50 hours would be self learning like sir rightly said i don't think teachers should look at certification as a reflection or an audit of how learned they are but it is a documentation of their progression just the fact that a teacher is willing to go through different certification programs indicates to me that it is a teacher who has a learning mindset that is a good sign a willing learning teacher will always improve and is a constant improvement for me as a school so i would genuinely appreciate there is nothing called a perfect teacher right. you are always progressing so, so i think it is imperative in the modern world that we live in and i think to be very fair from the indications that i have seen during the pandemic and post the pandemic even at webinars or programs like this the sheer increase in the number of teachers watching it yes. is indicative of their willingness and openness to learn so correct okay. they are not going to get extra attendance or they are not going to get paid by the school to attend a webinar that we are speaking at like your program says perspectives they want their own perspectives to improve and they want to feel good saying i am a better teacher than i was yesterday that's great and that's what we require all right so let me continue with you uh what should the new models of teacher assessments should be and why do you think we even require those kind of models to adapt with the ways of teaching should dictate what you are assessing the teacher on again there is no one size fits all if you are a particular school which is using certain sets of tools to deliver and impart your syllabus your teachers need to be competent in that the same competence if applied to a rural school where those tools are not available is of no use take a simple example of smart boards take a simple example of a lot of digital content available to the school in a server repository which it can use now the teacher needs to know how to use that those are tools which can add value to a science class or to any other class but if you go down to a rural school that teacher still draws the heart beautifully on the blackboard <clears throat> sometimes using different colors of chalk okay. to explain the arteries and the veins to you that's how we learn that to this day i have not seen a 3d lecture on the human heart but i learned how the human heart functions 
in a beautiful blackboard drawing that my science teacher drew. So what is required in that environment would in my opinion or should in my opinion dictate how you need to assess the competence of the teacher and the tools that the teacher is prepared for. Second is the learner's ability to receive that. You may have been trained uh, you know at Harvard School of Education or anything like that and if you come and talk at that level then you are going to be speaking at 35,000 feet and your children are going to be at ground level. <laughs> it's not going to help. If the teacher does not reach out to the student that effort is a wasted effort. Relevance is very important. Relevance and context. Yeah. Who are you teaching? It's very very important. Sometimes it's not even the subject it's the language with which the teacher teaches that reaches out to a child. Correct. I have heard sir speak in one of his talks where he learned mathematics in Tamil. <laughs> and he had a problem when he moved to another school where mathematics was taught in English. It's mathematics. The mathematics was taught in Tamil. Now, that teacher would have had to bridge that gap, you know, for him to adapt. So I think that's very, very important. Blindly saying these are the one, two, three, four assessments that a teacher should go through globally will be meaningless. Yeah. So your view? I fully agree with you, you know, uh, the fact that the typology of assessment uh, cannot be universal. Because uh, basically the context in which a teacher is, uh, you know, uh, teachers are, I mean, facilitating teaching, I think uh, that is different. So to me, I would like that freedom to be given to the teachers to opt the kind of assessment they want. So we need a variety of assessment models and assessment content available on the net and teachers can just go in and take up these models and get themselves assessed periodically to attain certain levels of growth. And I think, I think this kind of acknowledgement of these, the uh, one's own competence uh, is more important than a third party certification which is hung on the uh, you know walls of your uh, school. I think uh, uh, I mean, to be uh, you know uh, these you can have a hundred certificates uh, uh, displayed in your uh, room but then the real certificate is uh, uh, that your confidence level that you can deliver and that your, your ability to uh, opt for the immediate change uh, and then to be relevant to or uh, take the next step for being the next level teacher, right? And that kind of curiosity, that kind of willingness is what all the teachers need. All other certifications, uh, you know, are incidental. Okay, so are or is professional development and certifications, do these uh, serve as energy boosters for teachers? Yes, to a certain extent, uh, you know, uh, because if these professional certifications are authentic, if they are nurturing, if they are empowering, if they, are, they help a teacher to discover themselves, I think they have done the job, right? They really boost the energy of the people that. Otherwise, you know, you have certificates over there, everything. They, be, they don't really give you that kind of energy. Sometimes you look at the certificate and laugh at the certificate. How did I get the certificate? What is the use of the certificate? So it is not that paper that matters, but the, the kind of the, the energy that you talk about is that what you have acquired in the process is that. That is where the process product conflict comes through. Processes of learning are more important than the product of learning over that. For teachers also, the process of uh, their empowering is more critical than what kind of certificates they get. What about you? Are they energy boosters? I think so. Uh, classic example being teachers taking part in inter-school teachers quizzes. You've seen it, I've seen it. Why do they do it? It makes them feel happy. <clears throat> so I think this is like... Uh, you know, uh, Red Bull or Pokari Sweat or, you know, uh, uh, those kind of drinks to a sports person, when your salt content is depleted, you need a booster. 
So such events, I think, serve like Red Bulls yeah. for a teacher. We have seen how they behave when they press the buzzers. I mean, See, I, I am a great believer that a teacher is a slightly more grown-up student, <laughs> and that is how it should be. They should, in fact, I normally advocate to any school that invites me to the principals conduct all the events that you conduct for your students for your teachers. That's a very important energy booster. So such certifications are a reinforcement for the teacher that I am doing something to progress. I feel happy to go to school. I am better prepared than I was yesterday. So I think I can deliver better to my next batch of students. What does it result in? What Sir said is so true. It's not what hangs on the wall. It's how you feel within. At the end of the day, what's a good school? It's a happy school. What's a happy school? It's a happy teacher in a classroom. If you've got a boring teacher in 30 classrooms, I guarantee you, you've got a boring school. You have a happy teacher in your classrooms, you've got a bubbly school. So anything that contributes to a happy teacher who looks forward in the morning saying, hey, I'm going to go and teach today to my students and I'm going to do something that makes them feel happy, enriched and probably more knowledgeable, great. So I think it's, it's a very good recommendation, apart from the fact that because of the speed at which things are changing, I think there is an inherent scientific requirement, which is what NEP, etc. is advocating, saying teachers require constant learning. That's the need of the hour. But what it translates to as an outcome could even be simply more happy teachers. And, well, all we need is happy teachers. <laughs> Thank you, both of you, for joining today for this episode of Bala and Bala. Teachers, dear educators, update yourselves, upgrade yourselves. And to do that, you will have to uh, depend on self-learning, self-assessments, continuous learning, and certification. And like both of them said, <coughs> this will lead to a professional progression that you have been looking forward to and being a happy teacher. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Bala and Bala and join us in the next episode of this particular series, Bala and Bala Perspectives on Education. You take care. And taking part in a couple of quiz shows in the bargain <laughs> is not going to hurt. Take part. <laughs>